In 1978, Joseph Sledge was convicted of murder in North Carolina. They made me the scapegoat because they had no one to blame. At his trial, an FBI scientist testified that hairs found at the crime scene were microscopically alike to Joseph's. Just months ago, Joseph was released from prison after serving almost 40 years behind bars. DNA testing had proved the hairs were not his. Here's the hair from the defendant. Here's the hair from the crime scene. I'm looking at them under the microscope and they have enough characteristics where I can say with reasonable scientific certainty that these two hairs match. They believed in what they were doing, but they were not scientists. It wasn't science at all, at all. Joseph was at least the 74th American exonerated of a crime in a case involving the forensic science of microscopic hair analysis. It's not science to visually examine something and say they're the same. That's not science, that's subjectivity. The U.S. Department of Justice is now reviewing thousands of old convictions containing hair analysis testimony. Last April, it released a devastating assessment. In the cases reviewed, FBI testimony about hair evidence was scientifically invalid 95% of the time. This is a virus that escaped from the FBI crime lab and it infected the entire criminal justice system and it's going to take a lot of work to undo it. The integrity of the criminal justice system is at stake, plain and simple. This is the story of how for years, the FBI used an untested forensic method in courtrooms across the country, and of the men who paid for it with decades of their lives. In January 2015, Joseph Sledge walked out of prison for the first time in over 37 years. Did you ever think this day was coming? Oh, yes, I did. Yes, there was no doubt. He moved back to his hometown of Savannah, Georgia. We met him one morning on the river where he likes to go crabbing. By chance we catch a crab, it'll be a be act, act of God. <laughs> the thing. Oh, because when we was coming up, that's all we did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. My daddy took us on the dot, catching crabs. We had a good life coming up. We did, you know. Yes, we did. Joseph's sister, Barbara, also lives in Savannah. Wow, look at that. That's him, Mom, and him. Barbara was in her 20s when Joseph went to prison. He didn't get a chance to see his daddy when he passed. You know, I had to write him and let him know daddy passed. Had to write him and let him know mother passed. Had to write him and let him know grandmama passed. A little crab trying to get out, trying to get out of baskets in North Carolina prison. A little crab trying to get away, trying to get away clean, Lord, trying to make a move to find salvation. During his time in prison, Joseph filed more than 25 motions proclaiming his innocence. Finally, in 2000, he wrote to attorney Christine Muma. She agreed to take up his appeal. I believe that Joe's life didn't have much value to anybody, and I think he was completely discardable. Joseph's ordeal started in September 1976, outside a small North Carolina town. Here in the woods near Elizabethtown, North Carolina, in 1976, a brutal murder happened in this house. One Sunday morning, two women, a mother and a daughter, were found beaten and stabbed to death. Within days, police apprehended Joseph. The night before the murders, he had walked out of a nearby minimum security prison camp where he was serving time for stealing clothing. 
That's when my nightmare began. September 5th, 1976. Never forget it. Joseph was charged with double homicide. At his trial, the prosecutor presented two jailhouse informants who said that Joseph confessed to the killings. They received a combined $5,000 as a reward, about $20,000 in today's money. There were a lot of red flags in Joe's case. Um, the use of jailhouse informants is always a red flag. But the physical evidence didn't add up either. The murder scene in this case was, there was blood everywhere. It was on the refrigerator, it was on the walls, it was all over the floor, they were covered in blood. The perpetrator dripped blood throughout the house, and yet there was no blood on Joseph's clothing. Uh, the bloody palm prints that were found on the floor on either side of the sexually assaulted victim's head um, did not match Joseph's sledge. They knew they excluded Joe's sledge, so they just didn't disclose it. Um, they didn't give it to the defense, and they didn't give it to the jury. This is Deputy Sheriff Philip Little, who collected the evidence from the crime scene in 1976. Hello? Hello, I'm calling uh, for Philip Little. Little still lives in Elizabethtown, not far from where the murders happened. Looking at the dynamics of the case when I was investigating it, I wouldn't say Mr. Sledge is completely off the table. But was there any physical evidence connecting Joseph Sledge to this murder? I'm not going to get into that. But wouldn't there be one of his fingerprints in the house if he did it? Not Don't necessarily. You say? Or the palm prints that were inside the body that might match? But I, I don't want to get or into that. Or a hair that, that I don't might want match. to get into okay. the evidence. There was no physical evidence tying Joseph to this crime. I mean, the microscopic hair comparison was the closest they could come. At Joseph's trial, the prosecutor introduced to the jury a group of hairs found at the crime scene. How, how was the hair evidence introduced? It was an FBI agent from the, uh, from the, from the uh, FBI uh, forensic laboratory. And he gave an elaborate explanation that the pubic hair that was recovered from the scene were microscopically similar to mine. Microscopically similar. An agent from Washington, D.C. testified that hairs found on one victim were, quote, microscopically alike in all respects to Joseph's hair. You had the Federal Bureau of Investigation. That's like, that's wow factor to a jury. You put a federal forensic scientist on the stand and, God, whatever they say, that has to be true. The agent also said that hairs do not constitute a basis for positive personal identification, but the jury was convinced. What do you remember about the FBI agent that was brought in to testify about it? He was uh, persuasive enough to, uh, along with the testimony of the witnesses, to lead the course to believe that I was guilty. Without the hair testimony, you say they, they just... They, they don't got no case, period. What were you actually sentenced to? Two natural life sentences running consecutive. How can you do, how can you do one life? You can't do but one. You can't do two. You know, it would be one thing if you just had this one amazing story and it was an exceptional situation, but it's, unfortunately, it's not. Here are the headquarters of the nation's crack law enforcement agency, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Bureau maintains the most modern and completely equipped crime detection laboratory in the world. The discipline of microscopic hair comparison was developed not by scientists, but by law enforcement. Comparisons show that the strand of hair from the assailant's scalp is exactly the same as the hair of one suspect being held by police. The FBI pioneered hair analysis and used the technique across the country for over 50 years. Hair microscopy involves two things. One is that a properly trained hair comparison expert can make an association between a hair found at a crime scene and a suspect hair. Even a single hair may supply evidence. And then two is, oh is it possible to give a scientifically valid estimate as to how rare or how common that association would be? So in other words, could one in five people have left this hair or one in five million people? The examiner's trained eye can learn many things. Is it human hair? Of what race? 
animal hair, but family. It wasn't really until after World War II and the FBI set up a, a professional crime lab where the evidence really began to take a foothold in prosecution of criminal cases. From a microscopic examination of hairs, we can determine race, body area. Moore Samuel Clark was the head of the FBI Hair and Fiber Unit in the 1960s and 70s. He retired in 1979 and moved to rural Virginia, where we met him at his home. Where hairs are involved, it's usually a crime of violence. Horrible crimes and horrible people involved. Did you go into court and, and testify about hair analysis? Yeah. Oh, yes, very hundreds of times. Hundreds of times? The microscopic hair comparisons, the way the FBI did it, was based on approximately 16 different characteristics. Like the pigment distribution, the structure of the medulla. When you would lay out all those kind of, say, 16 factors in a hair, was there a, a database of hair to compare that to? No. We always had to state that it was not a basis for positive personal identification. Is there any way to say what the odds would be, though, of two hairs being matching 16 factors against 16 factors, and yet still from two different people? No. We really have no idea how um, the characteristics of hair are distributed in the population. You know, what's incredible and what would surprise people is that hairs on your head are not the same, that there is variation in one individual's hair. The hairs on your head are quite different depending on where they're selected. Dr. Terry Milton is the founder of Mitotyping Technologies, a DNA lab in Pennsylvania. She conducted the test that led to Joseph Sledge's exoneration. If you think about the way microscopy is done on a hair, someone is deciding what color is that hair. Microscopy is a very subjective science, and DNA is exactly the opposite. You have ATCGT, and in the other sample, you have ATCGT. You line those 800 DNA bases up next to each other, there's no gray area. When scientists figured out how to extract DNA from hairs in the late 1990s, the FBI stopped relying on hair comparison evidence. But by that point, the Bureau had introduced it at trials for decades, influencing thousands of convictions. In 2012, Dr. Melton's testing overturned two of those convictions here in Washington, D.C. Both men has spent over 20 years in prison. Hey, hi, I'm Josh Rushing with Fault Lines. I was arrested in uh, August of 1978. And when did you go in, Kirk? I went in 80, 82. Kirk Odom was arrested for rape when he was 18 years old. Sante Tribble for murder when he was 17. At Odom's trial, an FBI agent testified that Odom's hair matched hairs found on the victim's clothing. They said that it matched. And what was going through your mind when they said that? <laughs> foul language. <laughs> foul language. <laughs> you know, really foul language. The agent said he had performed thousands of examinations, and this result was a very rare phenomenon. They would describe with a kind of veneer of statistics how rare it was by talking about their own experience in the laboratory. Sandra Levick is the public defender who represented both Odom and Tribble in their appeals. They would use terms like, it's very rare, or it's highly unlikely. It conveyed to the jury a sense that this was statistically valid in some way. They said it matched my hair and all microscopical characteristics. And that's the way they presented it to the jury, and the jury took it for granted that that was my hair. At Tribble's trial, the FBI agent told jurors that he identified a set of human hairs on a stocking cap near the crime scene. But when Levick had those hairs DNA tested, she got very different results. We had all 13 of the hairs that the FBI 
had examined. They were sent off to Terry Melton at mitotyping. Nine of the hairs had come from the same source. A couple had come from different sources, and one was a doc. Two different FBI agents who had uh, looked at that and analyzed it didn't recognize that it was dog hair? It was a canine. It was a domestic dog, yes. My personal conclusion was the dog committed the crime. <laughs> yeah. Well, now, how do you reconcile that in your mind, though? Uh, yeah. How about that? This was an expert witness from the FBI. The idea that there might be problems with FBI forensics is nothing new. 20 years ago, an agent named Frederick Whitehurst blew the whistle on the science lab there, saying there were major problems then. He now is out of the FBI, and he lives here in Bethel, North Carolina. We're on our way to meet him now. Frederick Whitehurst is a forensic scientist who joined the FBI lab in 1986. Nice to meet you, Fred. Come on in my Thanks. We're putting human beings in cages in death chambers. Fellow, fellow citizens, based on garbage. In the mid-1990s, Whitehurst alleged that over a dozen FBI agents had performed false or sloppy forensic work. Whitehurst, you may remember, was the FBI chemist who blew the whistle on shoddy work at the Bureau's famed crime lab. I'm a law enforcement officer, and if I see violations of the law, uh, abuses of authority, corruption, or whatever, I'm required to report those. In response to Whitehurst's claims, in 1997, the Inspector General of the Justice Department released a bombshell report. The Justice Department's final report documented example after example of what it called scientifically flawed and inaccurate testimony. And I think it is highly inappropriate for the FBI to manipulate scientific data in order to obtain a conviction. The Justice Department realized there were broader implications. David Colapinto is Fred Whitehurst's lawyer, who closely monitored the Justice Department's response. And what they did was they set up a force of, a task force of criminal lawyers to go through and review all of the cases handled by 12 or 13 examiners mentioned in the IG report. In the wake of the report, the Justice Department vowed to review all cases called into question, including hundreds involving hair and fiber evidence. Even more disturbing, the Bureau acknowledged the findings have prompted a review of hundreds of other cases for possible faulty lab work. Justice officials insist they will give defendants anything where there is even the slightest doubt it could help them. But seven years later, in 2004, the DOJ ended the review. It never issued a final report, and it never notified the defendants whose cases were under review or their attorneys. In the hair cases in question, not a single conviction was overturned. The Justice Department and the FBI were officially stating that they had looked at the cases and they had found nothing and no one's uh, convictions had been overturned. Though there have been 74 DNA exonerations in hair cases, to date, none of them have been prompted by Justice Department review. Instead, they've been achieved by the detective work of outsiders. Well, in about 2008, I guess it was, um, I got a call from Sandy Levick, an attorney up in Washington, D.C., who was representing a man named Donald Eugene Gates. Donald Gates was the first hair case that Sandra Levick challenged. In 1981, Gates had been convicted of rape and murder in Washington. She said, um, do you have any information on a man named Michael Malone? I said, yeah, I've got seven gigabytes. I'll send it to you on a, on a flash drive. Michael Malone was the FBI hair examiner who had testified against Donald Gates. Whitehurst had named him in 1997. Just three years later, the Justice Department had identified Donald Gates's conviction as potentially a mistake. But no one notified Gates or his original lawyer. You had the complete picture of the identification of Mr. Gates, the correspondence between the FBI or the DOJ and the U.S. Attorney's Office, and then we knew of the failure to to inform anybody. More now on another big story we're following. In 2009, DNA testing exonerated Donald Gates. He had served 27 years in prison, at least nine of them since the DOJ first flagged his case. None of these individuals was contacted 
none of the defense lawyers was contacted. Again, they were sweeping it under the carpet. Knowing that they had people that had been locked up for 10, 15, 20, 25 years, it seemed like they should have been rushing to the defense uh, attorneys. Said, you know, we might have a problem. Nobody wanted to deal with this problem. Nobody wanted to confront what it really meant. It doesn't enhance your career to look into cases and, and start stirring around the dust in a 30 or 25 year old rape murder case. There's a whole lot of people behind bars mm -hmm. in the same yeah. situation. There's a whole lot of people in all over this country in the same situation. In 2012, the Department of Justice promised finally to conduct a thorough review. It has since identified nearly 2,500 cases in which hair comparison evidence was crucial to conviction. In the cases reviewed so far, the Justice Department found that 26 out of 28 FBI examiners made false claims at trial. So we can now say based on a statistically sizable sample of cases that they have reviewed, that they were wrong 95% of the time. The Department of Justice and the FBI refuse to speak on camera for this program. Publicly, they say they will notify defendants counsel in cases they review, but they will not release the names of those defendants to the public. At least 14 of them have already been executed or died of old age. There's a lot of lives at stake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of lives at stake, a lot of innocent people. Why? Why is there no sense of urgency? There really needs to be a sense of urgency. People are dying in prison. As of April 2015, the DOJ says that it has reviewed 1,800 cases, but in 40% of them, it closed the review not because it found no error, but because it failed to obtain the documents needed to review the case at all. In 2014, while Joseph Sledge was still in prison, the Department of Justice reviewed his case. It decided that it did not meet the standards for invalid hair testimony. Based on the, the Federal Bureau of Investigation's uh, review of microscopic hair cases and what they're looking for in testimony, they didn't feel Joe's case fit the criteria for questionable testimony. In other words, Joseph Sledge's trial was one of the 5% of cases in which the Justice Department says the FBI got it right. That was a case where they didn't overstate the probative value of hair comparison evidence. They were just wrong. It wasn't his hair. It would pass this current review. Yes. And when, still, it was just wrong. Just wrong. All my real close friends done died, done died, gone to the grave. What could they do to make this right for you? Give me 40 years. Give you 40 years? Yeah, my life. That'd be great. I can use that. <laughs>